So we're up to the third church in the book of Revelation. And the title for the sermon tonight is The Church in Pergamos. Okay, The Church in Pergamos. Now, um, out of the seven churches, when I, when I read through the book of Revelation, I look at the seven churches, when I, when I consider the church in Pergamos, it's probably like the, the, the words that Jesus Christ speaks to this church, to me, are more, more, uh, probably the, the more difficult ones, the, the more cryptic, if it will, okay? And, and as I came to prepare this sermon, I was kind of, you know, there was some things that I just sort of, you know, hadn't fully grasped, you know, I haven't fully um, understood, but I hope I've done well enough here to give you a good presentation of the things that are said. Because some other churches have things that are very clear, you know, very things that are easy to understand. And there are some things that are easy to understand with this church, but there's also some other things that, you know, uh, really require a bit of uh, study in the Bible or maybe even an understanding of the, of the city of Pergamos at this time if you're sort of interested in the history of um, churches. I, I don't tend to go into history all that much when I go through the Bible. I know a lot of preachers do. They like to go back and look at, you know, this city was like this. This was the, you know, this was the kind of, you know, uh, people that lived there. These were the influences of the people. But I, I try my best to stick with what the Word of God says and try to minimize, you know, the, the uh, additional things that people tend to look at when they go through the Bible. But look at Revelation chapter 2 verse 12. Revelation chapter 2 verse 12. The Bible says, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write. And just a reminder, the angel there is the pastor. So all these churches have a pastor. And it says, These things save he which have the sharp sword with two edges. The sharp sword with two edges. Now, this is the, uh, you know, the, the double-sided sword. Now, when we talk about the sword, the reason I asked Brody there to read through Ephesians chapter 6, because we were looking there at the armor of God. And one of the pieces of the armor of God was the sword of the spirit which is the word of god you know the lord jesus christ has left us with a sword okay left us with a sword so we can do spiritual battle and that is your bible okay and you know what it's not just you that holds the bible it's not just you that uses the bible or this church that uses the bible but we see there in in verse number 12 it's jesus that has the sharp sword with two edges you see even jesus christ uses the word of god you know even jesus christ can quote the bible and we've seen him when he was walking the earth and uh, you know uh, doing his ministry you know he went to fight he went to battle against the devil using the scriptures the devil's there trying to tempt him trying to make him fail trying to make him fall of course he could not because he was uh, god manifest in the flesh but jesus christ showed us the example he used the word of god he used scriptures to defeat the enemy to defeat the devil okay now, one thing I'll just quickly read to you that was read earlier, just in Ephesians 6.13, it says, you don't need to turn there, it just says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Brethren, we live today in an evil day, okay? I mean, I'm, I'm constantly surprised just, just how wicked this place is getting. You know, apparently, not long ago, apparently New York has now uh, legislated that abortions can be done up to nine months. Pretty much, you know, till the baby's being delivered, they're now allowing abortions. I mean, just the things that I'm hearing, I mean, it, it, it shouldn't surprise me, but it does surprise me sometimes, right? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, the fact that even abortions are legal anyway, the first place is just disgusting. It's just terrible, okay? I mean, they're just increasing in the same wickedness. You know, it's not like the nine-month-old is any less of a, or any more of a baby than one that's two weeks old or whatever, okay? But just hearing these things and just knowing, you know, when, when a baby is born, how fully developed it is, you know, how it has a sense, it knows its mother when, when the baby is born and it's put on the chest of the mother and it relaxes and, you know, when it's born, the baby knows that it's, it needs to cry to breathe. I mean, it's a fully functioning human being and they want to be able to destroy that baby. They want to be able to murder little children. I mean, we just live in a wicked age, you know, and, and the Bible tells us, you know, in this time, this evil day, we need to put on that whole armor of God. And of course, I just wanted to focus there on, this, on, this, on the sword. It says in verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You see, we're commanded to take the sword of the spirit. We're commanded to go to battle, okay? It's not just armor you know, and, and protect yourself from all the attacks that come your way. No, you, you've got to take up the sword and go to battle with the sword that Jesus Christ has given us, okay? Your thoughts might be, you know, but it's just a book. I mean, it's just, it's just letters on a page, you know. What kind of sword is this, you know? 
Well, I mean, if you've studied the Bible, if, you've, if your life has changed as a result of the Bible, it's a powerful sword. Okay, it's, a, it's actually had an amazing impact on your life already. I mean, just the fact that, you know, you're no longer on your way to hell, but you're on your way to heaven proves that it's a sharp sword, you know. And the Bible tells us, actually, if you can keep your finger there, go to uh, Hebrews chapter 4, please. Hebrews chapter 4, you know, just to reinforce something that's said about the Word of God. But the fact, if you've been able to have a, a, a more fulfilling Christian walk in your life because of the Word of God, it shows the effect that the sword can have on your life, okay? Where sometimes, you know, it, it is going to hurt you. Sometimes when you look at your life, you look at your sins, you know that that sword of God is, is, is cutting through. And sometimes we don't want to know what the Word of God says, right? Because we're comfortable in our life. We're comfortable in our sins. And sometimes we don't like hearing preaching not, not that the new man, the new man loves the preaching, but that old man, the flesh, doesn't like the preaching because it cuts deep into the flesh there. But look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The Bible says, For the word of God is quick. Okay, when it says quick, it means it's living. Okay, you know, the words in this book, it's not just a static printing like, like your average novel that you're going to find in any bookshop. The Bible tells us here that the Word of God is living. It's alive, okay? There's a spiritual uh, life that's contained in these words, and that's why it has an impact within you. It says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, okay? Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. That's why it's sharper than a two-edged sword. I mean, if you're going to battle with a two-edged sword, the most you can do is cut, you know the body, you know, damage the body, stab the flesh. But the, the sword of God, the word of God goes deeper, dividing asunder the soul and spirit. It goes deep into us, into, you know, the other, if you want to call it dimension of where our soul and spirit resides and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's able to discern your thoughts. It's able to discern the things that's in your heart. That's why sometimes when you hear preaching, you know, from, from either myself or from other preachers or whatever, and you're like, it, it just sounds like you're preaching about me. It sounds like you know something about me and you're preaching about me. It's not me. It's not the preacher, right? It's the Word of God that has discerned your thoughts and your heart. That's how deep it goes. It's extremely powerful to use. And that's why the world hates the Word of God. That's why, you know, this dark world doesn't want to know what the Word of God says. You know, even someone like an Israel Folau, you know, and, and what I believe is to be an unbeliever. All he has to do as an unbeliever is quote the word of God and causes damage, just even as an unbeliever. You know, even as someone that's unskilled with the sword of the Spirit is able to cause damage. You know, how much more then are the preachers caused, you know, called by God, you know, the pastors of churches or preachers to stand up with the word of God and cause some damage in this spiritually dark world, you know, damage to the, to the kingdom of Satan, all right? Uh, but I just wanted to point out to you that, you know, in, in, uh, if you go back to Revelation 2.12, it's the same weapon that's used by Jesus Christ. He's the one that has the sword with two edges. Now, when we talk about a double-edged sword, you know, I looked this up a little bit, but, you know, most swords, like swords in general, you have your single-edged swords, and usually your single-edged swords uh, have a bit of a, have a, bit of a um, curve to it, okay? And, and they're, apparently, they're better for slicing, for, for cutting through things, okay? Uh, but then you have your double-edged sword, and your double-edged sword basically is sharp on one end and sharp on the other end, okay? And the idea there is just so you can actually, you know, it, you, you may not cut as effectively as a single-edged blade, but you can cause a lot of damage, because no matter which way you, you swing it, you know, you can cut that way. And if you're in battle, right, let's say you're cutting down that way, and, you, and then, you, you know, on your way back up, you're, you can cause damage once again because it's sharp on the other side, whereas a single-edged sword can only cut one way, and then you've got to readjust your angle before you can cut again. But the double-edged sword, doesn't matter which way you, you, you move it, it's going to cause some damage, it's going to cause some, some, some effect with, with how you wield it. So, you know, as, as preachers, as, as people that get up behind this pulpit, because it is a powerful weapon, we also must be trained to use that weapon, okay? Because people can cause unnecessary damage as well, you know, unnecessary damage, you know, or even destroy fellow brethren because of, you know, unskillfully using the Word of God. You know, so you need to know the Word of God, you need to train yourself, you know, practice preaching in order to be able to use that sword very effectively. And let's go to verse number 13 now. It says, Jesus says of this church in Pergamos, 
I know thy works. So again, this church is doing good works, right? They're doing works. And, and the Lord recognizes the works that, that have been there. And it says, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Now, this is where it gets a little challenging. You know, Pergamos is being said here, this is where Satan sits, okay? And it's, it's more than just sort of this figurative thing. We'll have a look. Let's keep reading. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Okay? So it's, it's not just this passing thought that it's Satan's seat there, but Satan dwells there, says Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, just a few key things there. Obviously, this church um, has been facing certain persecution. One of their church members, Antipas, was uh, put to death. You know, he, he suffered a martyr's death. But yet this church did, did not re, you know, w w remain strong. This church was unmovable. It says here that they held fast in the name of Christ. Okay? They held up the name of Christ. They did not deny the faith. I assume these guys went through some persecution, some tribulation, where they've been pressured to, to deny the Lord God, but no, they stood up for Jesus Christ even at the face of death. Okay? But what really interests me is the fact that there's, it's Satan's seat is there, and that Satan dwells there, you know? And I don't know, you know, do you think these, this is figurative speaking? Do you think it's just some sort of spiritual application? Or do you think there's more to it, you know? I, I don't have a full answer to that. But I, I did look this up, and, and some people say that, uh, well, I mean, this is, a, this is a recorded fact, is that in Pergamos, there was this altar of, of, of Zeus, okay? Zeus is a Greek god, and he's the god, he's basically the, the king of the gods. So he's, he's the top god in, you know, Greek mythology, Zeus. And apparently there was an altar, you know, a, a, a significant, you know, a significant monument that was built that was called the Altar of Zeus. And that altar is, is still exists today, not in Pergamos, but it was taken to, I think, a museum in, in Germany, in Berlin. And you can still see that if you were to go there. It's, and if you look at the altar, um, it's, I mean, it's not the entire thing. It's, it's just mainly the steps that lead up to the altar. But there's all these pictures of all these other pagan false gods around there. So it gives us an idea of what Pergamos was like. You know, obviously this, this, this uh, city was full of idolatry. The city was full of worshipping false gods or other gods like that. And so maybe that's what it means by there being a, a seat of, of Satan, that being that altar of Zeus, you know. That's a possibility. I'm not, I'm not discounting that completely, okay? But when I, when I just want to base these things on the Word of God, you know, we know that Satan is real, right? We know the devil's a real, you know, fallen being, you know, a fallen cherub, and that he's roaming the earth. You know, he's, he's, he's going about this earth like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, I want to take you to a story in the book of Isaiah. Keep your finger there in, in Revelation 2 and go to Isaiah 14, please. Isaiah 14, verse 4. Isaiah 14, verse 4. And this is a prophecy of Isaiah um, long before the king of Babylon has anything to do with Israel, before they're you know, being taken into captivity or anything like that. Isaiah is given this prophecy from the Lord in Isaiah 14, verse 4. Look what it says here. Isaiah 14, verse 4. It says, That thou, this is God speaking to Isaiah, that thou shalt take up this proverb, proverb against the king of Babylon, and say, how hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased. Okay, so this is a prophecy about the destruction of, of Babylon, in, you know, in, in the Old Testament days there. And if you just drop down to verse number nine, so it's, it's a prophecy against the king of Babylon, right? Drop down to verse number nine. It continues on, it says, hell from beneath is moved for thee. Now the thee there is the king of Babylon, okay? At thy coming, it stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. He have raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations, and they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. These are like the worms of hell. Verse number 12, look at this. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? So it's quite an interesting thought here, this prophecy of Isaiah, that he's, he's prophesying, he's preaching against the king of Babylon, right? It says, look, your end is hell, 
you know, it's, it's opening up for you. The worms are ready to cover you. And then he goes straight into, you know, preaching against Lucifer. You know, that, that being, you know, the name of, of Satan prior to his fall. And saying how Satan has fallen from heaven. And so what I gather from, from this, guys, is that, we, obviously, again, we know with other verses, Satan roams this earth. And it seems like when I put this together, what we see there in Isaiah 14, you know, that the king of Babylon was under the influence of Satan, all right? I mean, that's pretty clear. He, the king of Babylon is being prophesied against, but by extension, so is Satan, okay? And it seems like Satan had set himself up there, or this is a future prophecy, but sets himself up in Babylon, and he's causing problems there, right? He's calling, causing problems for the people of God. And of course, Babylon was taken, you know, uh, sorry, uh, Judah, the seventh kingdom of Judah was taken into captivity into Babylon. There's always this association with persecution of God's people, okay? Persecution of Christians. Now, the other thing we know about Satan is not, he's not God, right? He's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at once. And so from what I gather here, if we look back at, if we can, you can go back to Revelation chapter 2 now, I would say, you know, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this, but I would say that Satan had literally set up camp in Pergamos. Okay, right while there, that's where his seat was. That's where he was dwelling, in Pergamos. And yeah, you could say that altar of Zeus was built, because, you know, if Satan is having this spiritual influence in this world, obviously he's going to drive the people of that city to, not to worship the true God of the Bible, but to worship false gods and, you know, get into idolatry and to get all those kinds of things. So it would make sense to me that Satan was in that city at that point in time and his purpose was to destroy this church in Pergamos. You know, he already got gotten away with, with killing one of, their, one of their church members and, you know, what other, what, other, you know, what other damage was he trying to do to that church? And this is why this, this, uh, it starts off here um, with talking about the sword of the Spirit, that Christ has a sword because as we get to the end of this, you'll see that Christ says, look, uh, I, I, I won't let you, I, we'll get into it later, but basically it says, look, I'm going to defend you guys, okay? And, you know, it would make sense that, you know, he would be defending them because Satan is literally, literally, the real Satan, right, is literally there attacking that church. And let's go to verse number 14, please. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. The Bible says, but I have a few things against thee. So even this church had a few issues, right? Uh, against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, Balaam is a prophet, or a false prophet, if you will, in the Old Testament. Now, again, th this is, th he's a challenging figure in the Bible. I mean, you go and ask the average Christian, do you think Balaam was saved or unsaved? You're probably going to get a 50-50 response. You know, you're probably going to get, yeah, look, these are the reasons why I think he's saved, and here are the reasons why I think he's unsaved. And you know what? I'm, I'm not going to tell you right now what I believe. I think I need to do a little bit more study in Balaam. I mean, I, can't, I've, I know the passages, obviously, that deal with it. And I know the arguments for him being unsaved, and I know the arguments for him being saved. Um, but, you know, that's not the key thing right now. The, the key thing is, even if he was a saved, you know, real prophet of God, you know, being, being used by God, in, and then maybe he turned bad, the fact is he had some false teaching. He had some false doctrine. And this church had allowed this same doctrine to creep into their church, all right? Now, have a look at this. It says there, um, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. So it's not necessarily that the pastor held to the doctrines of Balaam, but that the church had certain members that was holding to some false doctrine, okay? And we need to be aware of that, right? Like, you know, this church, we're, we're open to allowing anybody to come in here, you know, anybody to come in and learn and grow, and of course, I don't expect a person to walk in and be on the same page with us on every single doctrine, you know, you know of the Bible. You know, obviously there are going to be some differences, but, you know, that's where you need to work with the people. You need to work with them, explain things, answer questions. But it seems like these guys, these false, you know, uh, or people that hold to these false doctrines were not being corrected. You know, they were just sitting there, you know, causing problems for the church. So what are some of these false things that were being taught here? It says there in verse number... 14, just, just in the middle there. So the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak. Now, Balak is, was the king of the Moabites, okay? And the king of the Moabites basically wanted to pay Balaam, or he did pay Balaam, to curse Israel, okay? He recognized that Balaam had some type of 
you know, uh, gifts, all right, of prophecy. And he, he hires Balaam and says, look, Balaam, I want you to curse the Israelites, you know. And then when Balaam goes and asks God, can I curse them? God says, no, all right, don't you dare curse them, all right. And so he goes back and tells Balaam, look, I, I can't curse the Israelites. God told me that I can't, okay. And, uh, but what does he do? So Balaam, you know, just being sneaky, you know, still trying to find a way to curse. Like he realizes I can't curse Israel, but, but ba Balak wants, or Balak wants Israel to be cursed. So we've got to come up with another way, right? Because here's the thing with Balaam, if you, when you study his life, you realize this guy was all about the money, right? He was, getting, he was getting paid to do certain prophecies or doing certain things. He was definitely chasing the money. So what did he teach Balak? He says he, he taught Balak, taught Balak sorry, to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. All right? Now, keep that in mind, that, you know, that he taught Balak to cast a stumbling block, okay, before the children of Israel. Now, keep your fingers, th fingers there. Let's go to the story in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25, verse 1. Numbers chapter 25, verse 1. Let's get a little bit of this story. Now, when you're reading through the book of Numbers, okay, and you get to chapter 25, your first thought, you know, as you read it, you, you're, you're not going to think this has anything to do with Balaam, okay? You're not, because you, you, you don't really notice that till uh, several chapters later. But look at Numbers 25, verse 1. The Bible says, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Okay? So that's the whoredom, that's the fornication that was referred to in the book of Revelation. Okay? And notice they, they, they committed whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And I told you that Balak was the king of the Moabites. Okay? So these were people that were under his rule. And verse number two, And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, <clears throat> Look at this. Look how angry God was. He says, take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, slay ye every one his, his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. Okay? So this is what happens. The, some of the Israelites... You know, that they see the daughters of Moab. You know, they're, they're inf in, you know, infatuated by them. You know, and they commit whoredoms. They commit fornication. And as you see many times in the Bible, when, when, when these, when these, when these uh, you know, supposedly, you know, children of God, you know, take on, you know, wives of another nation or women that worship other gods, then their hearts are turned against the Lord God. They worship other gods. They bow down to other gods. And they even sacrifice. And they eat of the food that was sacrificed unto uh, the God. So that's the story that you see that develops there. Okay. Now let's go to Numbers 31. Numbers 31 verse 16. Numbers 31 verse 16. Because you're probably wondering, what does that have to do with Balaam? You know? Well, Numbers 31 16 gives us the answer. Numbers 31 verse 16. The Bible tells us, Behold, these caused the children of Israel, look at this, through the counsel of Balaam, to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Okay? So, uh, Balaam could not curse Israel, okay? But he goes to Balak, the king of the Moabites, and says, look, here's a way that Israel can be cursed. I can't curse them, but I know a way that God can curse Israel. Okay? Here's what you're going to do. This, this, you know, I'm just sort of, you know, coming up with a story here. But here's what you got to do, King Balak, you know. You know, send, send, send the prostitutes of your land, of the Moabites. You know, s send your, your whorish women out there, you know, to appease the children of Israel. Send them out there, you know, to, to bef befriend them, to spend time with them, to, you know, just, just to, you know, build, build friendships. And then those men will fall. Those men will commit whoredoms. And the Lord God will step in and curse Israel for you on your behalf. That, that, that's what happens, right? Because Balaam gives that counsel, gives that advice to uh, Balak. So that, that gives you a picture of that story a little bit now. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. 
And so this church had allowed certain people to come into the church. Why? Were they seeking to bless the church? Were they seeking to, to edify the church? No, they were in the church seeking to destroy the church. They were, they were there trying to you know, cause a curse to fall upon the people of God. Okay? Hey, they were behind the scenes. You know, when we read Numbers 25, there was no sign of Balaam. All right? And here's how, how wicked some of these false prophets are. They're behind the scenes. They come into a church. They act nice. They act like a prophet of God. Right? But then they, 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 they bring about situations to cause problems, okay, to cause divisions or cause, you know, false doctrine to come into the church. But hey, they have their hands clean. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. But they gave counsel to other people. They, they, they you know, gave a, they whispered a word to this brother. They whispered a word of gossip to that person, to that person, causing problems within the church. And here, not only, not only problems, not only, not only conflicts, but people were now eating foods that were sacrificed unto idols. And I've covered this topic before. There's nothing wrong with that in of itself, except when you knowingly are participating in that, okay? When you, you are participating, and that's giving honor to that false god. So these guys, you know, are giving honor to these false gods in the church, and they're committing fornication with people within the church. And of course, the Bible teaches us that if someone in the church is committing fornication, they are to be kicked out of the church, okay? So this wasn't going on. Now, they had some good works, and, you know, they were in a place of idolatry. They were in a place where Satan was dwelling. So I can fully understand how Satan had allowed or how, how, had organized for these, you know, these people like Balaam to creep into the church. So the lesson is there for us, guys. You know, the false prophet, and this is, this is basically just the wolf in sheep's clothing. Then you're not going to notice them on the outside. Okay? I mean, if they look like a false prophet on the outside, they're not a wolf in sheep's clothing. They're just a wolf in wolf's clothing. Okay, and they're easy to spot. But the, the wolf in sheep's clothing, the ones that are behind the scenes causing problems, they're hard to spot. They look like a, a normal believer, a normal prophet of God there. Anyway, Revelation chapter 2, verse 15. Revelation chapter 2, verse 15. So we've got these people that follow the way of Balaam in the church, but also in chapter 15 it says, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. And I've already covered this with the first church and we went through the Nicolaitans. Um, just once again, we don't know enough in the Bible to tell exactly what these people taught. But it's enough to know that whoever is in this church trying to influence us with false doctrine, we, we need to get rid of them. Okay? Otherwise, you know, God says here, Jesus Christ says here, that he hates those things. Okay? Verse number 16. Verse number 16. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly. Look at this. Repent. So he's telling the church, look, sort it out repent right get rid of these people he goes or else i will come unto thee quickly look and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth that's why jesus christ spoke of the sword in his mouth okay and the sword is the word of god okay so my <clears throat> what i gather here is this church may not have been preaching from the word of god all that much they may not have been using scriptures as strongly as they should have you know, the word of God was not, you know, getting rid of, of, of these people. Maybe they were just preaching your feel-good sermons. Maybe they were preaching sermons without many passages, okay? Or being very vague with teaching. I've seen this in church, you know, very vague on the gospel. Uh, you know, well, repentance is a change of, of way, which leads to a change of, of life. And it's like, well, what does that mean? You know, there's, there's no explanation so vague that you can even allow people that hold other false doctrines, other, other gospels to come into the church and be an influence in a bad way to the church. No, you know, it, it sounds to me, just, just from what I'm seeing there, Jesus said, look, I've got the sword, and if you don't sort it out, I'll bring the sword, okay? Because it sounds like to me they weren't using the sword, you know, that they were given, the, the two-edged sword being the word of God. So just a reminder, guys, that this church must be built on the sword of, sword of God. It must be built on the word of God, all right? I don't want to have a preacher up here. If you get up here and you never open the word of God as a preacher, oh man, that's a big strike. You're probably not going to preach again. All right? you never, if you never open the word of God, in fact, yeah, if you do that, you'll never preach again, right? But if you only open to one verse and your whole sermon's on one verse, boy, that's one strike, right? I'll give you free strikes or you're out. No, but I want you guys opening the word of God using the sword of the spirit that's been given to our disposal because it's powerful. Okay, it's powerful. It'll get rid of the false prophets for the false teachers as well 
in the church. Now, one thing I do want to show you here is you're in the book of Revelation. So go to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, okay? Because, you know, this Bible, the scriptures, I can't, we can't really cause much damage. I mean, besides Bible bashing someone, I guess, you know, if I get someone, just smack him over the head with this book. It's pretty, it's pretty big. I can, I can cause some damage, right? Physically, that is. But look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. And as we read this, I just want you to think about how powerful the Bible is, okay? Revelation 19, verse 15. This is the, the return of Christ when he comes back on the white horse. And it says in verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. I mean, this is quite a picture. When he's treading out the wine press, you know, that's when you're stepping on grapes and you're seeing that ju the juice, the grape juice is flowing out there. That's what it's going to be like when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and fights, you know, and he, he brings that sharp sword, right? And it's just going to be a bloodbath, okay? Drop down to verse number 16. <clears throat> oh, sorry, that's where we were. It says, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And of course, that's Jesus Christ. Verse number 20. Verse number 20, we'll just drop down a bit. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them, that he had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Look at this, verse 21. And the remnant, so the rest of the armies of the Antichrist, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him, that sat upon the horse. So he's saying, well, did Jesus, does Jesus have a sword you know, on his thigh? Is that, where, is that where he's slain these people? No, it's look, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. You know what, guys? When this book, when this Bible is in the hands of Jesus Christ, when he speaks those words, it does physical damage. It can kill people. It destroys people, okay? Using this word, these words is what Jesus Christ is using. It's not a, a, a piece of metal that's on his thigh. No, it's coming out of his mouth. He's speaking these words of God, this, this uh, you know, two-edged sword, and it's destroying the armies of the Antichrist. I don't know what that's going to look like, but that's going to be an amazing scene. All right? I mean, just, just Jesus Christ speaking the word of God, and it's destroying people. It's killing people. It's causing a bloodbath. It's the same book that we've got in our hands. All right? So, man, yeah, in the hands of God, in the hands of Jesus Christ, what he's able to accomplish, you know, we're able to accomplish something similar in the spiritual, in the spiritual realm, okay? We get out there, we preach the gospel with these words, okay? We can actually turn the tide of someone's eternal destination from hell to heaven, okay? They can, and and what, what are we cutting through? What are we destroying? We're destroying the false teaching. We're destroying the false gospels. We're destroying the false sense of righteousness within themselves and showing them what the Word of God says, okay? And giving them life. Giving them the life that comes by hearing the Word of God. It's a powerful book. Please pick it up. Read it every day. You know, don't let it just sit there gathering dust on your bookshelf or only pick it up when you come to church. No, make sure you take this weapon. The Lord God has asked you in this evil day to put on the whole armor of God and the whole armor also includes the sword of the Spirit, all right? Let's go back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. We're almost done. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. So Jesus Christ always ends with this little conclusion every time he speaks to a church. He says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And to him that overcometh, and already we covered that, that's those that are saved, okay? To him that overcometh will I give to eat, of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save in he that receiveth it. Okay, that's where we get the hymn, you know, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. Well, it, it comes from here. That, uh, our, our, one of our promises, this is sort of, I'm going to try to unpackage this a little bit to you, okay, is that we're given this white stone with a new name, Okay, with a new name, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So it sounds like 
in these, the new heavens and the new earth, we're going to be given new names. Okay, that's what it sounds like to me. And it's going to be given to us on this white stone. Now, something else that's quite interesting. Um, if you guys can go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Uh, you guys are just right there. And while, you, while you're going there, I'm just going to read to you from Isaiah 62 verse 1. Just very quickly. Isaiah 62 verse 1. This is, of course, referencing Old Testament Israel, okay? But as we all know, there were many saved that were in Old Testament Israel, and there were many that were not saved. But here, speaking of the saved, of course, it says, For Zion's sake, now Zion is a name given to Jerusalem. It's given to some other places, but at this point in time, it was given to Jerusalem. And we also know in the book of Revelation, there's going to be a new Jerusalem, a new Zion, okay? But anyway, for Zion's sake, will I not hold my peace? And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory and, and thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Okay, so here we have the Old Testament saints being promised there's going to come a time when they're going to be called by a new name, okay, which the Lord shall name. It's going to come from the Lord, okay. And we see in the book of Revelation for the believers, the New Testament believers, the New Testament saints, that we too are going to be given this white stone with this new name, okay. Further proving the fact that we're one fold, we're one people, okay. Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, we're going to be given this new name. Now, Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, look at this. This is, obviously, I don't want to go too much into it because it's about another church. But we, we, we can kind of put some things together here. The Bible says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. So just a pillar is obviously a, a piece of stone that's standing up straight, okay? And it can be used as for the foundations or it can be used to just build uh, or, you know, elevate certain things, a pillar there. Now, so we're going to, uh, so him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. So all of us are going to have a pillar in God's temple. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God. Now, these are the words of Jesus Christ, okay? He says, the name of my God, He's, of course, we know that's referring to God the Father, and the name of the city of my God, that being New Jerusalem, oh, it says that, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name, Okay? So a, a few things there, you know, that there's this pillar that's going to be uh, uh, given to each one of us. Um, it's going to have the, uh, the name of God. So let me just say that again. The name of, of, of God. It's going to have the name of the city of God. And it's also going to have a new name that's given to Jesus Christ. Okay, what's that new name? I don't know. Okay, well, obviously we don't know. But it, it's, it's, you know, it, it's here in this pillar which has to do with New Jerusalem. Okay, it has to do with New Jerusalem. And we know when we looked at New Jerusalem that it had foundations. Remember, those foundations had the name of the apostles of the Lamb. They're written therein, okay? So there's something significant about this new heaven, new earth, something significant about New Jerusalem where there's these names. There's, you know, it's kind of like, you know, some people put plaques on a wall or like a building and says, you know, this building was dedicated to or, you know, was, was, was constructed by this person. There's this, like this plaque there. But it's going to be something similar like that in the new heavens and the new earth. But it's going to have all our names. It's going to have the name of God. It's going to have the names of Jesus. And just, just an interesting thing. Now, it says there, it, it refers to that as a pillar. Now, the reason I go to turn there is, um, I'm just going to read to you from Genesis 28, just quickly. You don't need to turn there. But Genesis 28, verse 16. And it says here, this is about Jacob. And Jacob builds a few pillars himself. But uh, we read this not long ago in, in a previous sermon. But it goes, and Jacob um, awaked out of his sleep. And he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? There is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put up for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. Okay? So we see Jacob here talking about, hey, this is, God was here, right? And he says, and it terrifies him, right? So he gets the stone that he slept on, and he sets up that stone as a pillar, okay? And that's where I, I link what we read there in, in, in uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, or sorry, or tw uh, of Revelation chapter 2, verse, um, sorry, 17, where it speaks of the white stone with a, with a new name. 
and also the pillar that's set up for each one of us as well. It could be that that same stone that's given to us is set up for that pillar or that stone might be representative of the pillar that's built there in the house of God. So, you know, kind of like how, you know, some, sometimes if, you, if you're in a competition and you win a competition, your, your team gets a trophy, but then you might get like a winner's medal, you know, that represents that trophy, you know, that you keep forever. And that, that's kind of how I, think, I kind of think of it, is that that winning trophy represents this pillar that's built there for all eternity, but you get this winner's medal to represent that, you know, as that white stone. I'm not sure, you know, if you try to look it up at other places in the Bible, it's challenging. This is what I said, it's kind of quite cryptic here about this church, but, you know, that, that's, you know, it's a great privilege that the Lord's going to honor us with this new name, okay, and a pillar in the new heavens and the new earth. So let's leave it there. Let's pray.